Also praises for Felicia and Charlotte, who also had successful hand surgery. So we've got a lot of praises for successful surgeries this morning. Prayers for our frontline people, our people who work in hospitals, medical facilities, EMTs, rescue squad, fire people, police people, and also the people in our food services and people in our uh, services as in stores and restaurants and things like that. So just continue to pray for those people that help make life continue a little bit better for us than it could be at times. Would you pray with me? Loving God, we come this morning praising you for the resurrected Jesus. Praising you for the promise that the worst that can happen is not the end of the story. Praising you that you continue to reach out in love and mercy to us. We thank you for all these successful surgeries and situations. We thank you that Sharon Wilkerson is home. We thank you for the ways you help us. Jean Woolery was at service this morning and she had not been feeling well. And the way you show us in practical ways that you are a God of healing and of hope and of love. Be with us as we continue our service, as we talk again about the resurrection of Jesus. Give us your peace, give us your understanding, give us your heart to hear and understand and learn. In your name we pray. Amen.
And thank you all. Our scripture today comes from John chapter 20, verses 1 to 18. There's so many really cool expressions and descriptions of the resurrection in the various gospels. We talked about some of those on Tuesday night. I hope you were able to be with us for that. Here's John's account. Early in the morning on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone was moved away from the entrance. She ran at once to Simon Peter and the other disciples. The other disciple, the one Jesus loved, gasping for breath. They took the master from the tomb. We don't know where they've put him. Peter and the other disciple left immediately for the tomb. They ran neck and neck. The other disciple got to the tomb first, outrunning Peter. Stooping to look in, he saw the pieces of linen cloth lying there, but he didn't go in. Simon Peter arrived after him and entered the tomb, observed the linen cloths lying there and the kerchief used to cover his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but separate, neatly fo folded by itself. Then the other disciple, the one who had gotten there first, went to the tomb, took one look at the evidence, and believed. No one yet knew from the scripture he had had to rise from the dead. The disciples then went back home. But Mary stood outside the tomb, weeping. As she wept, she knelt to look into the tomb and saw two angels sitting there, dressed in white, one at the head, the other at the foot of where Jesus' body had been laid. They said to her, Woman, why do you weep? They took my master, she said, and I don't know where they put him. After she said this, she turned away and saw Jesus standing there, but she didn't recognize him. Jesus spoke to her, Woman, why do you weep? Who are you looking for? She, thinking that he was the gardener, said, Sir, if you took him, tell me where you put him so I can care for him. And Jesus said, Mary. Turning to face him, she said in Hebrew, Rabboni, meaning teacher. Jesus said, Don't cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go to my brothers and tell them, I ascend to my Father and your Father, my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went telling the news to the disciples, I saw the Master, and she told them everything Jesus said to her. Talk a little bit about this morning. The title would be, Why Are You Weeping? Why Are You Weeping? I remember the first time I heard this story, I was in uh, primary Sunday school, if you know that terminology. And Mrs. Coon was telling this story, and she was talking about Simon, Peter, and John running to the tomb. And she referred to herself and to Georgia Elliott, who was our piano teacher, a piano player. And she said, I'm older than Georgia, so I'm Peter. It took me longer to get there. Georgia would have gotten there as John. And that was kind of a fun way of remembering this. But these women, as we heard earlier this morning, go to the tomb to prepare the body of Jesus. They couldn't do it on the Sabbath, so they go to prepare the body. And Mary gets there and looks in, and it's empty. It's empty. I told the story Tuesday night. When I go to visit a hospital, if I've been to see you that day before and you were in room 510, and I go back the next day, I always check to see what room you're in because I don't want to walk in the room and see an empty bed. Mary alarming. So Mary was alarmed. What's happened to Jesus? Now remember the last few weeks Jesus has told them over and over and over he had to die and he'd raise again. But panic, grief, I believe all those things had their mind controlled. We don't see anything about the angels appearing to Mary, to Joseph, shoot, to Simon and to John. But we find out later when she goes back and looks in, Two angels were sitting there then. Perhaps, I don't know, there's all kinds of explanations. Perhaps God knew that Mary had a listening heart and needed to hear this assurance. And they say to her, woman, why do you weep? They already know what's happened. Mary hasn't quite connected yet. She was worried they had taken Jesus' body and moved it. There was all kinds of shenanigans going on with the Romans and what had they done with the body of Jesus to prove he couldn't raise from the dead or perhaps some of the Jewish leaders. 
And all she worried about was, where's the body so I can take care of it? She was caring so much for Jesus. And then she's out walking, and she sees this person that she thinks is the gardener. And I've read so many accounts and heard so many sermons on why she didn't recognize Jesus. I think there are a couple of things. Number one, it's still early morning. Perhaps it was foggy. It could have been that she was so overcome with grief that she couldn't see Jesus. Her vision was clouded. It could have been she couldn't even lift her head. She was in so much grief. But again, she says, what, what happened? What happened? And Jesus says, why do you weep? And he says, who are you looking for? She says, just tell me where you put him. Just tell me where they moved him. And he says one word to her. And I don't think it was in a big booming voice. I think it was in the most tender, loving voice when he says, Mary. You know how some people's voices you recognize no matter where you are? You may hear your voice taken in glory or in vain in a conversation. You hear your voice, you hear your name. It's kind of like they say mothers can recognize their babies no matter where they are when they're crying. Or in my case, I can tell when it's Rudy barking or someone else, something else. But he says, Mary. And her eyes are immediately open. She doesn't say, what happened? How'd you get here? Why weren't you in the tomb? What happened? I see her just being filled with love and grace and tender mercies. You know, this is the depiction in our stained glass in the sanctuary. And he says, don't hold on to me. Don't hold on to me. My job here is not finished. I'm going to ascend to the Father. I think he knew she probably would have wanted to stay right there, holding on to him in that precious moment. Instead, he gives her a job. Go tell my brothers. Tell them I ascend to my Father, and to your Father, and to your God, and my God. And the scripture this morning said the women left the tomb dumbfounded, their heads spinning. Not Mary. She was on her way. She went telling the news to the disciples. I saw the master. And she told them everything he'd said. We weep for lots of reasons in our life. As I get older, I weep at a lot of things. Sometimes even dog food commercials. I weep at memories. I weep at fun times and joyous times. Show me a little baby and I'm probably going to tear up as long as they don't cry or do anything else. We cry for different reasons. Mary was weeping, I think, because someone she loved had died. I think she was weeping because the dream had not come to fruition. These folks that followed Jesus in these early days, they perceived that the Messiah had come, that the Roman occupation was going to be over, and that the truth they'd been taught all their lives was coming into fruition. I'm sure there was a lot of disappointment in her weeping also. And we weep for a lot of those same reasons. We weep when things we hoped would be don't come through. We weep when we just don't know what to do next. We weep when we can't see the way through. I think sometimes we need to do as Mary and simply listen for God's voice. Listen for the authority of God's scripture. Listen for the tenderness and the voice of those who share the Lord with us and realize that it's God. It's God speaking to us. It's Jesus calling our name. It's the Spirit helping us understand that the worst that can happen is not the end of the story. And I think we need to have the same response Mary had. We need to tell other people. Go tell everybody that Jesus Christ is here. Go tell everybody. Go tell everybody that Jesus has made a difference in your life and my life. Especially those people who knew you before. Especially those people who haven't seen that side of you. Those people who don't know that Jesus is your hope, your salvation, your joy. Easter is a wonderful time. You know, it's, it, as a kid, it was getting that basket, you know. As a kid, it was 
being excited as a kid, it was dreading putting that new dress on uh, and having to go to Sunday school in it, especially three quarter length sleeves, okay? Let's don't go there. The next worst thing was a hat with a little stringy under here. Some of you are old enough, you'll remember that. But as I've gotten older, Easter is the hope of a new day. Easter is the hope of a better life. Easter is the hope and the knowledge and the surety that Jesus has risen from the dead and that Jesus is risen from the dead and that Jesus is with us. So why do you weep, Mary? She didn't understand the whole story. But we have the honor, the privilege, and the blessing after all this time of knowing that the story didn't end at Golgotha. The story was only beginning at the resurrection. Down through the history of the church, we've celebrated this meal in many ways. Today it was at a little wooden folding table outside. Today it's at this wonderful glass altar. Sometimes it's been a metal cup, a paper cup, a piece of cracker. But today we remember that Jesus met with his disciples and those who had followed him. He met in an upper room with them, and during that meal, he took bread from the table. He blessed it, gave thanks for it, and broke it. And he said, this is my body. Take and eat of it, each of you. They still didn't know the rest of the story. They probably didn't understand what Jesus meant. But he offered it to every one of them. And in the same way, he took a cup from the table and he lifted it to heaven and he gave thanks for it and he blessed it. He said, this is my blood poured out for you as a sign of a new and everlasting covenant. Take and drink of it, each of you. They understood covenant. They understood blood. But they didn't quite understand it all yet. And each time we eat this meal, we share in this time, we remind ourselves that Christ is risen. That Christ has died, Christ is risen, and Christ is coming again. Hallelujah. Loving God, bless these elements. May they remind us that the story was not finished that night. And the story is not finished this day. But because of your body, because of your love, the story continues. Christ's body broken that we might be whole. The love of God shed abroad in all our hearts. Sending forth, I want to share to you something from a book I use that we use often in our service and our bulletins. Spread the message, Christ is alive. Live the good news, our lives are renewed. We have seen and heard the good news. We have been touched by the presence of Christ. Share the word, God's peace is offered to all. Communicate the power of love, be transformed. We are saved and reconciled and empowered. God has chosen us to make all things new. Announce and proclaim, God is our strength. Rejoice in the promise, we too shall triumph over death. We will tell our friends of our discoveries. We will witness to God's surprising activity. Go in peace this week. Remember that the worst is never the end of the story and that Christ lives. Amen.